The stories that I'm about to share with you in tonight's episode are so deeply disturbing and terrifying, I had a rough time recording this episode. The events that I'm going to speak on are true and are documented. These are the events of the land between the lakes. In western Kentucky, there is a nationally known area commonly referred to as the Land Between the Lakes, or LBL for short. Consisting of more than 300 miles of shoreline, it is situated right between Barclay Lakes and Kentucky. Almost 200,000 acres of forest and over 200 miles of walking trails alone set this gargantuan revenue stream of nearly $600 million a year for the forest industry. However, ever since the area's inception, even going back before Europeans have settled here, it's always had a very dark and grim history. There are hundreds of small family cemeteries dotted all throughout the acreage of forest that are all from early Kentucky settlers and Chinese immigrants and African slaves, even dating back to the 1700s to where there are literally bodies from the Revolutionary War. And unfortunately, during this same time, the mortality rate among infants was exceptionally high, and so many mothers would bury their children right outside their cabin so this way the moms could look outside the cabin window and peer at their children's graves. Among all the European settlers, the African slaves, and the Chinese immigrant graves, there were also numerous Native American graves scattered not all just throughout the area, but even before European settlers ever showed up. This area in particular has always been the hot conversation point of strange hauntings, Indian curses, among other strange supernatural occurrences. But what you've all came for is the several tales that have been reported numerous times all throughout the years spanning centuries is a humanoid wolf-like creature said to stalk the forest looking for its next victim. While there have been reports of this being killing humans, most notably, what is documented down is people fearing for their cattle's lives and their livestock's lives because this thing had an appetite for killing livestock. It was described as being nearly seven feet tall, on two legs, thick, long, matted hair all over its body, and a stench reminiscent of death itself. Many referred to this beast as the Wolfman because the tracks that it left, they were similar to that of a human's, but where the front portion of the feet should be, where the toes are, instead they were claw marks resembling somewhere between half canine and half human. The head was reportedly very huge, had a very long snout and teeth that were like razor blades and eyes glowing red like the fiery pits of hell. Arms incredibly long with long spindly fingers and sharp claws at the end. And many times at night, it's been documented over and over that many people from immigrants to settlers to natives would all hear this thing howling and growling off in the distance. And they were terrified to such an extent that some of them would even go out and tie up their livestock or bring their most prized livestock in the house with them overnight to keep them safe. The legend of this particular beast started at least 100 years ago. And over time, it's just been passed down by word of mouth from generation to generation to generation and family to family. And since this time, new sightings and experiences just keep on occurring. One theory is that this wolf creature used to be an evil native witch who could shapeshift back and forth between man, this wolf creature, and an actual wolf and do whatever he pleased. And the story goes that he had apparently been outcast from his own tribe for the use of his black magic. And in doing so, he was tracked down by several of the tribe's warriors and killed while he was in his wolf state. And in his last dying breath, he put a curse on the land and everybody who lived in it, saying that he would come back for their lives. Another theory floating around is that this creature was actually a European settler who had come here in the 1800s, who had apparently carried some sort of disease which would turn him into a madman during the nighttime, and eventually his family would go into complete solitude and everybody just figured them dead since nobody had heard from them in a very long time and the family had become completely isolated when in the early 1900s their homestead was found completely vacant with no signs of anybody ever living there for a long time. So there's a lot of speculation surrounding the mystery and drama of the wolf beast. Moving forward a little bit in history, you have French traders and explorers who inhabited the area in the 1800s were being warned by Shawnee tribesmen, shaman and warriors alike of a tall, dark wolf-like creature inhabiting the forests, while other legends claim this wolf creature to be a shape-shifting Shawnee shaman. Accounts of this creature literally go all the way back to the 17 and 1800s when settlers first started arriving here. I mean, there's 
there's written accounts of hunters going missing in the nighttime, people hearing these strange unnatural howls off in the distance, being completely frightened by the tone, timbre, and pitch of what they're hearing because it's so out of the realm of normalcy for them. During the 17 and 1800s, bison were still a very prominent part of America's wildlife. And in fact, they even roamed a good portion of Kentucky where multiple hunters would find their carcasses half eaten, their throats completely torn out by a massive predator. And even now, up to 2022, with the forest service industry trying to restore the bison life in Kentucky, still find calves missing constantly. As time would go on, communities began to build and expand in the area. And even though there were thriving communities just budding up, it was still considered a very rural place to live pre-1950s. Prior to 1959, predating the Kentucky and Barclay Lake dams being constructed, the area was actually referred to as Between the Rivers. And in 1963, a president, John F. Kennedy at the time, officially labeled it LBL, or Land Between the Lakes. And even now, in 2022, sightings, experiences, and strange things are still going on to this very day all around that area. One of the more frightening documented cases that occurred to a group of university students who were camping at Land Between the Lakes back in 1973, the story goes that a group of young college guys got together to go have a good time to go camping. They were sitting there next to their Volkswagen microbus, just enjoying the nice warm fire, enjoying a beautiful spring evening in the middle of lush nature when one of them had to respond to a nature call. So he goes off into the woods and takes care of business. And while his friends sit around the fire and continue talking and enjoying each other's company, Company. When he comes back and they could tell he's visibly concerned when he wasn't before, he was just laughing and having a good time. And now he's saying, uh, guys, I went to go pee and I felt like I was being watched by something. And I heard this strange sniffing noise in the woods. His friends, of course, tried to downplay it and just said, you know what, man, you probably just heard a hog or something or maybe a bear. Don't worry about it. We're fine. But he would not accept that as an answer because as evening turned into night, he began to grow increasingly nervous, and as night grew more and more, the boys would start to become more and more tense, no longer being able to just brush it off as nothing, because now they could sense that something was wrong, and they could hear shuffling of something moving all around their campsite, and in fact, it wasn't just moving, it was circling the campsite. So something, a predator, was large enough and intelligent enough to use strategy to keep hidden out of the light of the fire, to circle around the campsite like it was stalking its prey, and they could hear it shuffling and sniffing around, and they could hear whatever it was was moving very swiftly all around their campsite back and forth just waiting like a cat waiting to pounce on a mouse the boys at this point extremely anxious began shining their lights around the woods expecting to find something but their light never caught anything because this thing was so intelligent it knew and was able to keep out of the light. And that's when howling had erupted from the woods around them, similar to that of a wolf howl, but deeper and guttural and blood curdling. And the howling had erupted from all around them. So now they were completely surrounded by multiples of these beings making these noises. And that's when they begin to see glimmering eyes going back and forth and passing around their campsite. And they'd only catch it for a glimpse and then it was gone. And so now, as you can imagine, things are growing incredibly tense. All of the boys at this point are completely terrified. They all run into the Volkswagen bus and are deciding, we got to get out of here. There is something stalking us. We are terrified. So they get ready to pull out. And as they do, and they're going down the dirt road out of the forest, they see something in the backlights, the faint lights of the Volkswagen. They're being pursued by a large black figure that looked to be like a wolf chasing after the Volkswagen. And as their vehicle had slowed down to approach a corner, they feel this massive jolt in their Volkswagen, and they could see that this creature was holding on to the Volkswagen with all of its strength, trying to hold the Volkswagen and pull it back. Pressing down the gas pedal as hard as they possibly could, they were finally able to get enough leverage to fly out of there and be gone. After breaking free and tearing out of the woods, they did not stop until they had arrived back on campus, where they would all get out, completely shaken, nearly in tears. And when they went to inspect the back side of their Volkswagen, they found four deep gashes like claw marks torn into the metal of the engine compartment on the Volkswagen.
1978 in Grand Rivers, Kentucky, which is the starting point of land between the lakes. There is a documented case of an individual who was staying at his aunt's house for a few weeks during a summer vacation, so this was right around mid-July, in the evening time, surrounded by the Kentucky wilderness of hundreds of acres of woods all around. This home had been built down a hill into the side of a large dirt hill, and along with this, there were several man-made trails that led to various portions in the forest, like an old abandoned railroad track, the shoreline to Kentucky Lake, an old abandoned sawmill that was no longer in use and had not been for a long time, and with the addition of a new dirt bike this family had just acquired, it would help define the trails a little more and easier. And as this case begins, the main eyewitness of this documented case is 17 at the time, his youngest cousin is 10, and the one out on the dirt bike during this time is 13, who goes by the name of Joe. He's out running around in the woods, the eyewitness's uncle is at work, and his aunt is at the store in town. So it's just them home right now, and he remembers the woods around them being very serene, very peaceful, full of squirrels and birds chirping. So him and his youngest cousin were awaiting Joe to return, since his own father strictly forbid him to be out on his dirt bike in the woods after dark, and so they were expecting to hear that dirt bike sound coming up back upon the road up the driveway. And so the eyewitness and his youngest cousin in the story are just sitting there and goofing off when they hear Joe's dirt bike, not just slowly and casually changing gears and coming up the road to the driveway, but flying down. I'm talking full throttle, no gear changes at full speed, just flying. He comes flying out of the woods so incredibly fast, he actually goes airborne for a few seconds before pounding down on the pavement, and he's clearly terrified, and now struggling deeply with his descent down the hill, trying to keep the bike straight and upright. The eyewitness and the youngest cousin could see that he wasn't sure how he was going to stop the bike, and so he turned turned his bike to slide it, and out from underneath him, it goes flying. As he hits the brakes hard, the bike begins to slide sideways as he's coming to the very end of the driveway. Joe had begun to tilt his body so the bike would go out from underneath him while he went down the rest of the hill. The bike, caught in a perpetual spin, eventually sputtered and died. Our eyewitness and his cousins were completely terrified by what they were seeing, completely in shock, mouths open, eyes wide, they were not exactly sure what was going on and why Joe was flying out of the woods. But as Joe pulled himself up covered in dust, he's visibly crying, he's shaking, he is completely terrified by something, and he keeps looking back up at the hill and looking back at the wood line. And he's scanning, and he's looking around really nervously, and he's taking deep breaths and heaving. <sighs> He's clearly panicked and looking at something, because something had to have been following him with the way he's acting, and as the eyewitness and his cousins are watching this unfold, they're looking at where he's looking, and they look up to see at the top of the hill where he's looking at, and they're looking back at Joe and looking back there and trying to figure out what is he so freaked out about, and as this is going on, Right around where they're at, they have a dog pen full of basset hounds, and these basset hounds start erupting, going crazy with growling at something up the top of the hill. And that growling soon turns to whining and whimpering in desperation as these basset hounds are trying and desperately clawing and gnawing at the cage to try and get out because now they could sense there is something up in that wood line that's coming. They grab me, look at my leg. Joe was screaming to them, showing them the claw mark on his right thigh. Whatever it was that had got him had torn through his denim jeans. You could see visibly on his leg where the jeans were cut and blood was seeping through on the wound. And the mark wasn't just like some sticker bushes or he had hit a branch. It was a clear defined claw pattern. And he's walking around taking huge gulps of air, crying with every effort, striving to properly portray what had just happened to him. And he's there huffing. It was following me along the path by the old sawmill. <sighs> it kept saying it ran on two legs. It, it was on two legs. It chased me. It saw me and it came after me. His eyes are all wide. He's bugged out. He, he keeps looking around as if he's waiting for this thing to pop out at any moment. And his heart is thudding in his chest. And he is just waiting. And his heart is just throbbing in his chest, going crazy. And the next thing you know, a howl cuts through all the drama and all the conversation immediately from the very top of the hill where Joe had just come from. And nearly instantaneously, all the dogs that were acting frantic, trying desperately to get out of their pen, stop. And all their attention in unison is brought to the top of the hill and all the hair on the nape of their neck is standing straight up, looking, anticipating something. And our eyewitness and his cousin are now confused at what is Joe talking about? Two legs, a snout, it got him. What? It was at this point that Joe turned around to face his siblings and his cousin, and he's pushing them with both hands on the back, saying, come on, we gotta go now, we gotta go, pushing them physically into the house to the front door. And this is right where it 
came out. The eyewitness cannot believe what he's seeing because at first, it appeared from the outline of where it was coming out from to just be an exceptionally large wolf, but as it went down the hill and approached the one-lane road that would connect itself to the driveway, it was a towering wolf creature that easily rivaled the height of a man, if not a foot or two taller. Completely dumbfounded by what they're witnessing, their brain is trying to rationalize what they're seeing as well as deal with what it's seeing in real time. Judging by its wolf-like appearance, this is clearly no Bigfoot. And it stopped and stood there and raised its arms up to the sky and let out a deliberate, low, guttural howling noise as if to give praise to the oncoming darkness of the nighttime around it. In that moment, a security light at the end of the driveway popped on. It was one of those lights that popped on but took a couple seconds to gather all of its energy to fully illuminate the area. And as it did, this thing used its arm to shield its eyes from the glare of the light. And in this very moment, our eyewitness and his cousins for the first time knew exactly what Joe was talking about. This simply wasn't an it. It was not a person in a costume. It was not a Bigfoot. This was a wolf creature. And as you can imagine, they all go tearing into the house as fast as they possibly can, doing everything they can to barricade the door, putting shelves in the way, putting bags of dog food in the way, just trying to keep safe, locking the door, holding onto the door. All of them running into the kitchen, grabbing hold of knives, ready for anything, and then go barreling towards their aunt's room, locking the door and hiding, just shivering and shaking, waiting for the next thing to happen. And the basset hounds outside in the pen are going crazy again, and they could hear this thing approaching the house. And it gets up on the porch and it's thrashing around and breaking stuff and moving stuff. And then it goes to the side of the house near one of the bedrooms. Fortunately for them, not the aunt's bedroom, but a different bedroom. And then they hear glass shatter. So whatever this thing was had now broken the window in an attempt to get in the house from on the outside. And they're all huddled together. They're, they're shivering. They're shaking. They're terrified. They have no idea what's going to happen. And they're clutching their knives. They're, they're waiting for the scene to just bust down the door. And they're going to have to try and survive. Almost like clockwork or out of a movie, they hear the horn of a Cadillac coming down the driveway to let them know, hey, I'm back with groceries. You need to come out and start bringing everything in. But neither of them responded. They were so terrified. They just remained huddled together, never breaking free, too scared to even respond respond to their aunt or mom's calls. Wondering why they were not coming out to greet her, she actually had to go up on the porch, unlock the door, and push this wall of miscellaneous items out of the way just to get into the house. And everybody stayed put until she came to unlock the door. And after asking them, why didn't you respond? They told her outright exactly what had happened in their whole story. And her response was strange because she didn't laugh, she didn't cry, her expression and emotion was just blank. And it wasn't until after she came back from inspecting outside where there clearly had been something, a window broken from the outside in that she finally realized something was off. Later on in the evening when the uncle had come home and the aunt had relayed the series of events that had transpired this evening to him, he goes and talks to the kids and tells them, stay out of the woods. And to make matters more terrifying, he goes on to tell them his own findings. Earlier that same morning, he had gone down the path that led to the old sawmill and found pits dug on the sides filled with animal carcasses and bones that simply could not be explained. There was also holes dug into the side of the bluff that overlooked the old sawmill, easily resembled a small cave or a den large enough for a full-grown man to be in. And several years back before this, the old Boy Scout camp used to be on the other side of Grand Rivers. And then it had had become commonplace to see a strange human wolf-like creature along the shoreline near the campsites. It was only a few weeks after these events transpired that the eyewitness had gone home, but this story would shake him and stay with him forever. And finally, we have the horrifying and gruesome events that occurred in the land between the lakes in the 1980s. Two police officers would give their terrifying account of what had happened this evening. Both of them had received a call to go on an investigation near the rural campgrounds in the land between the lakes. With the tourist season about to start very soon, early birds were already showing up getting the prime spots for camping. So, while the campgrounds were in the process of filling up, it was still relatively empty. Upon arriving at the scene was not only a coroner, but several coroners from out of the county, as well as an ambulance. And unfortunately, there were no victims to save in this case because everybody was already dead. The first eyes to feast upon this gruesome display of murder was a very young, untainted married couple who were completely shocked upon their findings. 
neither one of them wanting to leave each other to go and get help. So both being incredibly nervous and disturbed by their findings, traveled to the nearest town in order to seek help. And in turn, Grand Rivers then called the authorities to go investigate. This married couple was so freaked out by what they had found, they refused to go back, only giving officers directions and pointing them in the right place to get where they needed to go. And the young couple themselves decided to stay the night in a hotel, not wanting anything to do to go back there. A flurry of police vehicles, people from the county, anybody to investigate a possible homicide was showing up on the scene in mass. And all they found was a lone little camper with a small little campfire just kind of going barely. And this campfire was now rekindled to give them a little more light, in addition with all their spotlights and other equipment around them. I think at this point that everybody on the scene knew it was about to be very bad but they never expected what they would find. Approaching the motorhome, they could tell already that the front and back doors were open, with one being bent on its hinge and slanted slightly. And shining their lights in, they're looking around, and they see lots and lots of blood, lots of handprints and blood, tearing all along the metal siding. Something very deadly and gruesome had took place here not that long ago. Crime scene tape was now being placed all along the perimeter and white little evidence markers were being placed all around where they would find pieces of evidence such as ripped bloodied clothing, three bodies and body parts, separated limbs and a pile of human bowels, and pieces of loose flesh barely clinging onto muscle tissue. The three bodies were in such bad, gruesome shape that they could only suspect that it was either a psychotic man who had gone on a killing spree or a group of sadistic murderers. These bodies were so badly butchered that the police could not really tell what kind of weapon did this. They suspected it could be a chainsaw, possibly an axe, but the weapon appeared to be unnameable because they could not figure out what it was until inspecting a little closer and the wounds all match that of a well-defined claw. The nature and severity of this particular crime scene was so appalling that many law enforcement officials and medical personnel were retching, and rightfully so. Law enforcement had thrown out all kinds of theories like a bobcat, a bear, a coyote. What could this possibly be? But as the coroner examined the bodies more, he just kept shaking his head, not sure what to make of this gruesome scene himself and he went on to explain this. The claw marks on the back of the father's corpse was made by four distinctive claw prints with a smaller digit like a thumb. The span in total was wider than that of a man's hand, but also vastly different than that of a bear's. And the gouges and tears in the flesh were deliberate, as if whatever made this was trying to grab at its prey from escaping which makes me shudder to think about. The bite marks is what really disturbed them even more because the snout and the size of whatever bit them had to be larger than any coyote, any wolf, bear, or mountain lion. There were also clear indications of large pieces of flesh, muscle, and bone being ripped off the body of these corpses. The thought of a bear came to mind even though grizzly bears are not native to the area. They tossed around the idea of Maybe one slipped through or snuck down here, but it's really unlikely. The fact that a grizzly would have to cross several states and several rivers to even get to this area without much opportunity for food or breeding just didn't really make much sense. But the only thing they could wrap their minds around was a bear because there's no known being from the animal kingdom that has this kind of brutality and killing power like a bear does. One of the officers had stepped outside the back of the motorhome holding a small dress of that of a little girl's around five or six years of age, which meant that there was a little girl with them. However, she was nowhere to be found in the immediate area. So a new search began and they prayed for her safety and survival. All of this is going on, additional law enforcement were arriving, volunteer rescue squads were also arriving, new groups were showing up and being assigned to explore and examine certain areas of the crime scene. There was so much orchestration going on to just try and grasp what could have caused such a grisly murder and why. A freak bear killing just did not make any sense. More corners would continue to show up, more samples would be taken, and in one of the samples taken in a bag was the torn father's arm, and in his dead fingers was a clump of tangled matted fur, gray and brown hairs. This fur would be later analyzed at a lab. Remember this, I'm gonna get to this in just a minute. While everybody was hustling and bustling and trying to get this figured out all around the campfire and all around the motorhome, they hear a scream turning into a whimpering from about 50 yards away into the woods. Terrified at what could have happened, they all go running over there to try and see what had just happened when it's an officer with his hat in one hand and blood on his face, with blood continuously dripping onto him. Something above him 
Immediately, they all show their light sources up looking for the source of this dripping blood. And all law enforcement could see in that moment is a long, slender hand hanging off a large tree branch and a leg, completely lifeless, with a white sock still on the foot. After going up there and retrieving this little girl's body, whatever had taken her had just been casually eating on her corpse, sprawled out and laid on the branch. And that same gray and black fur was found sticking into the bark right near where her body was found. The exact same gray and brown hair that was found tangled in the dad's fingers. Within hours after this discovery, many of the law enforcement and medical personnel were sent away as new investigation teams would arrive on the scene to try and help figure out what could have done this and why. Law enforcement specifically though, were strictly given the orders to not talk about this, especially to the media, given the severe circumstances. And many of them, many of them held on to that awful secret for such a long time. And pretty shortly thereafter, the results from those tests came back from analyzing that gray brown hair. And do you know what they found? The species was that of an unknown origin, the closest DNA they found that matched the hair on the crime scene was that of a Canis lupus, a wolf. These stories were very hard to tell. They are deeply disturbing and very terrifying. I greatly encourage you to do your own research and dig and see how much you can find. But I'm gonna tell you, you might not like what you find. And please, whatever you do, stay out of the woods.